Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I would like to begin today's session by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners and custodians of the land that I speak to you from today. On behalf of myself and everyone else on the call, I'd also like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are the land's first storytellers and pay my respect to elders and ancestors. All right, hello, hello, everyone. Feel free to drop into the chat um, where you're from, where you're dialing in from. Um, and I know Josh loves to do this. What do you have on for lunch today? Um, I will move into a question, um, which is how I want to kick off this session with you. And wherever you might be joining us from today, um, I want you to write down the first most instinctive answer that comes to mind when I say, do you run your business? or does your business run you? If you stepped away from your business for a while, what do you think would truly happen? Would it thrive or would it you know, barely survive? I know that can be a bit confronting to think about, um, but the good thing is that it doesn't have to be um, because we are here to talk about this very notion that's been buzzing around the business world a fair bit nowadays, um, which is how do you set up a business that runs without you? Um, and you might be wondering, why would I not want to run my own business? Um, why would I want to remove myself from the day-to-day -day stuff? And maybe you don't. Um, maybe you do enjoy um, the more granular aspects of your business. But the truth is that if you're looking to grow your business, it needs the necessary um, infrastructure and systems to grow sustainably. Um, you need support systems, then you need to be able to have them run fairly independently. The other hard truth is that um, one of the toughest challenges that early stage founders face is poor operational design. You know, among the many founder things that they love doing, nailing operational design doesn't top the charts because it isn't particularly sexy. Um, and it's also plain hard to just figure it out at the start. Um, what systems are you going to need? How do you automate them? And how do you um, ensure that others run them responsibly? Um, now, we're going to, of course, deep dive into all those questions and more. But before we get underway, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nikita Lamba. I am the marketing and community manager here at Luna. Um, I made the jump into the startup ecosystem in, um, you know, odd and unexpected ways as well. Um, a stint at um, Startup Bootcamp Australia as an entrepreneur in residence, um, and then a brief period of working with one of the teams there. And then I landed straight into Luna with um, really with the aim of, you know, working my marketing and community building muscle and learning the startup side of, um, of life. My work at Luna um, spans brand strategy and building community and partner relations and really finding new ways to let people experience Luna and our services. For those of you who don't know Luna and its services, um, we essentially exist to help founders launch and grow their businesses. Um, we support founders at every stage of their journey. Um, and we have three cross-functional teams that do that. Um, so there's teams working with those that are just starting up um, through to scaling businesses, um, as well as corporates and VCs. And through these like three teams, um, we essentially offer our core services. Um, so we've got legal, which looks at everything um, you know, operational from setting up all the way through to, you know, taking on investment and the ultimate exit. Um, we've got accounting, um, which supports the end-to-end -end financial needs of founders at every stage. So that involves, you know, bookkeeping and payroll, forecasting, financial modeling, valuations, tax, um, and virtual CFO. And we also have our labs arm, um, which focuses on education experiences. Um, and we do this for schools, universities, um, and of course, founders. Um, and we also focus on curating events and workshops um, like this um, very webinar that you're dialed into, um, basically with the, with the purpose to add value um, to people who are in the ecosystem. Now for a bit of Zoom keeping, um, today's webinar will go on for an hour. Um, we we'll leave sort of 10 minutes for questions at the end, but please feel free to um, type in your questions using the Q&A function just somewhere below on your screen. Um, also, this session is being recorded and as always, <clears throat> we'll share it along with any resources that we talk about today. Um, and that's it. And so with all of that out of the way, um, I will get started. It is um, my absolute pleasure actually to introduce our guest for today, Sarah Agbula. 
Um, Sarah is the founder of Mtime. She's also a partner at Arctic 90. And I will definitely let Sarah talk about both of those because I will do a botched job at it. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, Sarah's achievements are truly second to none. Um, her work has led her to you know, achieve so much in life, um, even winning things like the Forbes 30 Under 30 and um, the Women's Agenda Small Business Leader of the Year. Um, and her expertise in community and startups and recruitment has um, led her to becoming an advisor at the Australian Government's National Careers Institute. Um, she's a member of Australia Post Stakeholder Council um, and also a member, uh, board member for the Foundation um, for Young Australians. Um, that's a lot of achievements. Um, so obviously, it's uh, no surprise that I am really excited to be speaking with you today, Sarah. Welcome. No, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, so good. Um, for everyone that's on the call, we were just um, having a proper bitch about Melbourne's weather, um, but the sun is out, so I'm quite excited. Um, all right, to kick us off, um, can you tell us a bit more about your background and your experience in dealing with recruitment and community in the startup space? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, before I founded M Time, I actually was on a gap year and a bit bored, and my friend had just started a platform on that was all about helping young people get into careers in innovation or volunteering or in a, um, or in social impact. And so I started this Facebook page, um, and I saw him working on it, and I really liked the idea of it, um, but it wasn't getting that much reach. Um, and since I had time on my hands, I actually messaged him and said, hey, can I actually help you build this up? I think I think I would be able to kind of work my way through the platform and grow it. So we ended up teaming up and then we ended up building the Facebook <coughs> to a few thousand people, started a website, started a blog, um, and were able to create some partnerships as well, all in the youth impact space. Um, and at the time, I didn't really see that as being very entrepreneurial. I didn't even see it as community building, um, especially because back then it was a lot easier to get reach on Facebook because this was like 2000. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't really see it as that, but it was by doing that, um, I actually got contacted um, by a three-day startup program that Melbourne Uni, Uni was running. And they asked if we could share it on our platforms because we had quite a bit of reach in that space at the time. And then also said, why don't you come along to this basically what it was, was like a hackathon. Um, and I thought, again, I was on the cap year, I had time. I was like, yes, this sounds fun. Um, and then it was going there and really learning about entrepreneurship that really inspired me to create something. And that something ended up being M Time. Um, and that's a business that gives busy parents their time back by matching them with family assistants that we train up to do a mixture of housekeeping and nannying tasks. And as part of the social impact, we work with different charities, community groups, and not for profits to actually help women who are under or long term unemployed get back into the workforce through those roles. And it's really been a, a process of learning by doing because I kind of used all that experience I had in community building to connect with all those different organizations. And that was our funnel for recruitment. And then even just doing volume recruitment, I was 22. Um, when all of this happened. Um, I didn't have any experience in that. I had been planning oh, wow. after my gap year to go um, and study law, but then because the opportunity came up to build something and I already liked community, I was already having a lot of fun. I loved just, I loved that you got to create something that every single thing that you did, you'd see the output. Mm -hmm. um, decided to give it a go and just learn by doing how to recruit hundreds of people and vet them. And because it was childcare, I learned a lot about compliance and OHS and it's just been building upon it. And that's why systems and ended up becoming so important to me now because I've been able to leave M time to be run by my team because we systemized everything and it's given me a chance to actually start working with other businesses and get a bit more creative and even just take a break at the beginning of the year, which was really nice. Because yes. Was years of nonstop. Um, so that's a bit about my background and I guess what led me to this interest in systems as well. Oh, that is so interesting. So when, when did you start M time? Uh, so went to the hackathon in 2015 then studied the Master of Entrepreneurship for 2016 mm. and started, launched M Time in 2017. Oh, wow. <clears throat> All right. Um, but I also know um, that your partner at Arctic 90, and that was something that like, I didn't know initially when we started chatting and then you told me and I was like, oh, all right. Um, so can you give us an, a bit of an overview of what Arctic 90 is and what that sort of role as partner is like? Yeah, so Arctic was founded by who um, Ashani Chattopadhyay, who was a longtime mentor. Like I met her in 2016, actually, um, and she's helped me throughout with M Time. And so then when I got to the point of like, I'm about to like step back, I'm still going to be involved in M Time, but I'm going to have my 
my life back basically um what what is my next step and she said she's been advising startups on new market expansion especially startups who are in australia or in india wanting to see actually what are the growth potentials in either country but then also the us and the uk um then she's also been helping businesses with operational design execution because you kind of get caught up in the weeds and it's hard to go from macro to micro really quickly um and all of that was really interesting to me as was the concept of you know, I, I always say like, and I, you know, success in a business is 10% idea and 90% execution. <clears throat> so I wanted to do something that would be focusing on that 90%. So then we basically, I joined her, we rebranded her already existing company to be Arctic 90 to signify that. And what we're really doing now is working with businesses on operational execution and helping people with the 90% through operational audits or even doing staff augmentation and going in and being interim operations people, which is really fun to pull the skills from end time and working on those other mm -hmm. into different businesses. And having, yeah, and having like um, a different variety of um, businesses, I guess, to deal with. Yeah, because I mean, it's been one thing for so long. And so it's so much fun to be able to see different problems and think and, you know, use the base principles in yeah. different ways. Oh, how good. Um, yeah, um, I think, I mean, you know, you touched upon um, business systems and operational design. And even in my introduction, I said that, you know, we're going to be talking about um, business systems. Why are they important? Why do we set them? Um, but starting off with the bare basics, um, and this is a question even I had not too long ago, what is a business system? How, how do you define it? Well, to me, it's just the blueprint of how your business works. And so I think whether or not you realize that you have a system or not, there is a way that your business works and there's a, and we ourselves as people, we have systems like the way that you work every day, whatever your patterns are, that is your system. And so having control over your systems is kind of your, the way to control your success and being aware of what those pieces are and what you do out of habit, because we are all creatures of habit is really empowering. So that's how I think of it. Okay. So you'd call, you'd say it's the blueprint of how you design, um, how you plan to run um, the show. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And whether you've planned it or not, that system is always in place just from what you do every day. Mm. Oh, um, yeah, I guess that's just getting built. It's like a bit of a um, DNA situation. What mm. would you say, um, especially for founders, um, what are the benefits of having systems that I guess um, a bit more planned, not the ones that start running just um, off the bat? And also, is it beneficial to um, identify the need for them like really early on? Or do you wait a bit? Well, I think if we're thinking early stage, one of the benefits of being aware of your systems is just that it helps you be able to, ma to measure what you're doing. So for example, if you're trying to grow your customer base and every day you do X, Y, Z thing and you're not seeing results, then there's something wrong with the X, Y, Z that you're doing. Mm -hmm. if you're not getting the output that you desire, then you need to look at the actions you're taking and see what tweaks you can make. And so for early stage businesses, um, my main advice wouldn't necessarily be to think really hard about, all right, um, we have to have a big marketing plan and we have to be really clear on what we're doing. Instead, I would say you need to just know exactly what you're doing so that you'll be able to measure the results of what happens when things change. And when you see those patterns of things changing and you see those meaningful, meaningful results, that's the point where maybe you want to actually solidify that system, build upon it or document it so that somebody Ooh. else can start running it for you. So it's really about empowering yourself with how your business is running. Sometimes you talk to people and they say, oh, I am getting customers, but I have no idea what they, where they're coming from. And I don't know what mm. they're doing. And then it's just, that's just exhausting. Like I've, I've been in that boat before when you're just doing so many things, throwing things at the wall, unless you're really diligent over what each thing is doing and what its impact is. Um, it just overwhelms you, especially in that early stage. Yeah, because I can imagine if you're saying, oh, I'm getting so many customers, I don't know where they're coming from, but it's a good thing. Even once you start losing them, you're like, oh, I don't know exactly why I'm losing them. Um, and I don't know what to address. Yeah, um, exactly. And you don't yeah. know um, whether you're spending your time wisely or your money wisely. And neither of those things are things that we have lots of at the early stage. True, exactly. Oh, um, even more so now. Um, I think, you know, when you're talking about like all these systems and, you know, one could mean, for example, like with customer capturing, so like sales and marketing, but um, there's so many systems that we don't even know of in our business. We don't think of them, you know, as a system um, running in the background. So can you perhaps dive into what's, like, what are the systems that run in a business? Yeah, so the, the main ones kind of fall in buckets. So there's sales, um, sales and marketing, which we've already sort of spoken about. There's finance and accounting. Um, I put HR as its own separate 
bucket um, for hiring, how you manage people. Um, and then you've got operations. And within that category of operations is where things can get very complex, depending on your business. So speaking to my experience at M Time, our operations was basically recruitment and customer service and having mm -hmm. systems around both of them. Um, and then there's subcategories within that of like within recruitment, what's the process for compliance? What's our process for regulation? And if you had a product business instead, then your operations and that system is probably the supply chain. How do you deal with, again, you'd also have customer service. How, what's, your, what's your stakeholder management for all your suppliers um, and things like that? So each of those things, almost, it's basically everything that you do in your system, in your business, everything that you need to do, will have like a, maybe a micro system around it and a micro process. And then it's the map of all those things, almost a web, which is what forms that blueprint of your business. Um, so I think it's that operational piece. The rest, luck, I mean, the good thing is that sales and marketing, finance and accounting, those areas are pretty set and standard. That, that those are areas where, like, as Luna said, like they've got sort of really amazing people who can help you with some of those things. But it's the operations, which is really mm -hmm. to you. And it's really on you as a founder to work out what that looks like so that you could eventually move to delegate those and then do all those founder type things like raising, building mm -hmm. team about those. Yeah, um, that's when I, I mean, that's exactly what I was thinking about in the intro. And I was like, oh, like founders really want to focus on founder things, you know, um, they want to sit there and think about strategy and reading in like long term vision. Um, but there's, um, you know, also that question of limited resources that we just said, you know, time and money are very precious. So thinking about these, um, these kind of things, are there certain systems and processes that founders can set at an early stage so that it's easier for them to go off and do these founder things? Yeah, I would definitely say um, there's, a, there's a balance at the really early stages because you don't want to kind of systemize, systemize things too early, especially while you're still working on product market fit, because at that stage, you want to be as flexible and nimble as possible. Um, so what I would suggest and what I ended up doing in my company was whenever <clears> there was a stage where even if a process wasn't exact, but to kind of detail the key outcomes that we want to have from it. So that at least, you know, if you're working towards those outcomes, you're still guided in the right direction and you're still focusing your efforts um, on the right things as well, because otherwise things come up and you get so scattered. So having those key, and I always limit it to two to three outcomes per thing that you're doing so that you don't get mm. overwhelmed. Um, but once you do get to a point where there's, because there are some things that will start to get repeatable especially once you've had your first few customers, for example, there's probably mm. going to be a set series of questions that they always ask. So that's when you can actually document that, put the answers to those questions and you could make it like maybe the task that is like, actually the system we're going to design is it's going to be self-help. And then if it's not one of these, then someone step, steps in. Like that's really simple. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily think of that as a system, but it'll absolutely save a lot of your time and increase conversions once you kind of recognize this is a repeatable piece. This is something that I can actually, yeah, systemize and document. Um, and I think at that early stage, you don't want to go too far beyond that, except for things which are set standards. So things like, you know, accounting, that's not necessarily something that you need to work out. You know, you don't need to reinvent the wheel mm -hmm. for those things, but your operational area, that's the one that you really want to keep flexible, but keep tight in what your goals are on each piece. Um, yeah, that makes so much sense. Um, I'm thinking now that you mentioned that whole um, aspect of, you know, maybe automate it or like keep it to a certain point before you bring in um, custom help it makes so much sense. And I've just realized how many um, businesses I've dealt with that make you do that. Yeah. They're like, oh, like approach this, this, this or this um, until and if that's if none of that's really answering your um, problem, then we'll step in. Um, I was going to ask when you're when founders are working on maybe figuring out what systems you know they want to automate um, versus you know not just yet um, is it is it uh, is there merit in making these decisions with um, like a wider team like is it or is it a very sort of solo process because you know your business that well? Um, by wider team, do you mean getting in a consultant or do you mean talking to like other like? Profound. Getting in a consultant or having people in your team like provide that input, do you think that is it makes the process long drawn? Um, what's what's better? What's more effective? I think I think it really depends on the business itself. I very much advocate for the founder 
being really in the weeds at the beginning while you're still trying to work towards product market fit and product channel fit, like all those places when you're still working out what is our repeatable process for getting customers or users or whatever it may be. I think it's quite important that they have, you know, their finger on the pulse. However, what I think is really, really helpful is to have somebody to help you with accountability and somebody to actually look at what are you doing? Does this make sense? Because I, I was a solo founder. And so I was doing all of the design myself, but I have different advisors like Ashani, my now business partner that I go to of saying, this is what I'm doing. Or if I had gaps, um, it was also really helpful to go outside of that for help. I did an accelerator program and that was actually, that was probably the first time I really got into systems because I was like, I am tired all the time. Why is this? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they were like, well, what do you do every day? And, I'm, you know, and that's when I'm like, well, this is what I'm doing every day. They're like, your system is terrible because you're doing everything manually. Why don't you automate all these things? Like you said, you mm. did it every day. Why don't you automate those pieces? And then write down how that works in the automation. So if you have to change it, you can. Um, and then that gave me like at least 10 hours of my week back. So I think it's important that you know it really well, but you've got to be able to have those moments to come out of the weeds and get external input um, to make sure that your system makes sense. So it does make sense to just do a bit of a sense check sometimes. Like otherwise, yeah. there's no way you would have had your 10 hours of the week back, I guess. Yeah. And there's always so many new technologies coming out as well. And so if you don't take your head out of the weeds, sometimes you'll miss, I mean, there might be a task that you're doing, which couldn't be automated when you first were doing it. And then lo and behold, somebody's brought something out and then it would save you all that time. Um, yeah, no, there's a few things um, that we end up using at work as well. And I think it's like, you know, without this, um, life would be so much harder. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I feel like one of what uh, that's one of the things. And the other one is like if you have like assistance, right? Because automation and automating systems is almost like basically having assistance. But when it's when it comes down to other people and um, you know, being able to delegate work, um, that's one of the key skills that um comes up um in like the founder journey a lot, you know, the art of delegation. Um so when we're talking about building a system or building a business that can run without you, training your team and trusting them um, are both very important. Do you have any tips? Like, have you seen a lot of this happen? How should, like, how can founders delegate better? Yeah, I mean, the most foundational piece of advice I got around this was that you need to be delegating responsibility, not tasks. Because if you ask someone to do something for you, then they're still going to check in with you. They're still going to they're still going to be asking questions. You're probably still going to go in and have to do some of it, things like that. Because you know you're the founder. Nobody, even though sometimes you don't really feel it, people still like they work for you. There is still a bit of a divide, even when you're really early stage and you're usually friendly with everyone. But when you say here is a task, these are the key outcomes that need to come out of this task. It's your responsibility to make sure these outcomes come to in, into fruition then you can actually stop thinking about the task. And, you know, you still need to show them, you know, be clear on what those outcomes are. And like, this is what success looks like, for example, in this task. So that way, that's all you're measuring. The system itself, if once they've got it working, they can show you how it works or ask them to document it. That's something that I was doing quite a lot to like help save time. And again, I was like, and a successful documentation of this task looks like this. Um, and before, when I was just giving tasks, it was I was always frustrated. It was always still tiring. Um, and then, you know, I, my personal rule of thumb is that when you get into that stage of micromanaging, it's actually because you're not, you're not in a place of trust. Like you don't need to, mm -hmm. if you trust the people around you. And so that was always kind of my tell of like, have I actually given this task or delegated this task to someone properly? Like, how am I feeling? And whenever I was like, all right, they have full responsibility over it, then things are much smoother. And now I only check in with my team a few times a week. And it's like, what are the, what are the problems only? I don't hear mm. about what's the day-to-day because -day, I don't need to know. I already can see because the I can see the outcome of their work in just our dashboard. So I already know that it's working. And that's how you'd know if your system's there or not. But instead, it's like those outlier things, which I talk about, and it doesn't take as much time. Um, yeah, in your case, it sounds so also like intentional, right? Because you wanted to um, like claim your, your time back because you knew there was ways to run it. Have you ever um, experienced when you're working with, you know, like other teams and founders and um, and helping them with their businesses? Have you ever experienced the need for, um, you know, like not stepping back just yet or like founders that just refuse to stop doing like the micromanagement? How do you do that? 
Uh, I absolutely do. And that's when I point out to them that like, what is it in your team that you're not trusting? Like, what is it that you're actually afraid of? Because that's that's what it comes down to. It's fear. And it's a perfectly reasonable way to feel because it's your baby. Um, I think it was, I mean, it was only five and a bit years in before I like really started like, take this, take this, take this. Because before that, I was so scared of like, especially like customer service for us, that was always really important. I was so scared of that not happening in the right way. Um, but really it's like, what aren't you trusting? What does success look like? Like write that down, be really clear because if it's also not clear in your mind, then that's what's adding to the fear because you're actually not sure there's some insecurity there. So that's always the thing that I advise of like, get clear on what you're doing, recognize the fear, embrace it, and then start with those smaller pieces. And then once you kind of have that belief and that you see that things will be all right, most people find that that controlling nature starts to go away and if mm-hmm. it's awesome, to be really frank you've got to rethink what you're doing because you can't build a company without a team if you want to be growing it that's so true um no so true it's just funny because yeah you see so many people that like truly struggle with um like delegation and then just be like oh, if no one else can do it I'll just do it um but I guess that's not sustainable. Um, we have a question that's come in from anonymous attendees so sorry I don't know your name but um they've asked what tools and systems thinking about like software is good and ones that are not so good? Um, (laughs) I don't want to be too biased and talk about what's not (laughs) good because it's probably very unique to my circumstance of the ones that I haven't had good trouble, I haven't had much success with. But my favorite by far is um, Zapier. That saves that saves so much time and so much of my life because it's it basically is just a plug-in tool that will bring different software systems together and make them talk to each other. So for example, mm-hmm. um, when we're doing recruitment, somebody applies, we can go in, in Zapier and have automatic filtering so that if they pass this section, they get this email. If they don't pass this section, they get another, you know, email automation. Then we also have automatic grading. Um, we also have it plugged into our like customer service so that when you know, those ally things come through, they can be sent to us <clears throat> into um, even just all our training materials and things like that. We use Teachable for all of that and all the certificates and grading um, videos are all plugged in through there. And one of the best things about it is that it works with most things. Um, there's mm-hmm. very few platforms it doesn't work with. Um, the other one, which I really enjoy is Monday just for project management, which also plugs in very nicely <laughs> with Zapier. Uh, but those are the two that are my faves. And I think they're also really easy to use. So once you're first starting off, they're good ones to look to. Um, and for Zapier, especially because it really maps out what your what everything looks like. If you make changes, it's also easy for you to see and kind of map out, well, this is what the system was before. This is what we're changing it to. So you've got that historic information to go back to as well. Um, so good. I'm writing down the notes because I'll send out resources to everyone after this. And I'm a um, big fan of Zapier. Yes. We use it a lot with our Slack um, mm, yeah, yes, because yes. it came down to a point where we'd be doing either, you know, weekly reminders to a team or, um, you know, filling in your like leads and, and stuff like that. And now we're just finding even more and more ways to connect, um, you know, inquiries to Zapier and like things just auto filling. Um, so, yeah, that was a very good answer. Um, a uh, good question, I mean, but good answer as well, I guess. Um, we've got another question um, from Gemma. What percentage of revenue or profit or how much total do you feel that it should be spent on system software? Um, and I'll, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. And I'll actually add a bit of an added um, question. And then like, how do you assess how much like it should start changing as you grow? Yeah. Well, in terms of spend, that's another one that's very difficult for me to answer because it really depends on your business. For example, if you're a pure software business, then almost everything should be going going into building that. Whereas maybe if it's a service enabled or if you're a product and it's more e-commerce, then that would change. Um, you know, general rule of thumb for your operational budget should be, like, what did we usually do? We did like 20% just to kind of curb. So that when we were kind of doing our revenue forecasting and things like that, just as a rough estimate, but it really is specific to your business. So if you're a pure tech, most of your time and energy and, and revenue should be going into how you can build that out. Can you remind me of your second part of the question that you asked? Sorry. Um, so the original question was about um, how much you should spend and how do you figure what the growth should be? Is it, you know, then you sit and assess what's like, these are the systems that work that don't work. Um, does it, does your expenditure grow considerably? Yeah, of what of the different systems that you use. Yeah. Again, it's I'm sorry this is like such a cop-out answer, but it really yes. depends 
because that operational piece of all your systems is so specific to your business. I can speak to um, M Times experience there, where for us, like our biggest expenditure expenditure is really on people. So our um, systems budget really is only like ten to twenty percent. And when we were think when we were going into actually building custom pieces, there was like a big financial outlay at the beginning. But to be honest, for us now, it's just a maintenance fee. So we just put five percent we've put aside just to go in for like if there's bugs and things like that. Um, and that's unique to our case because we're a tech enabled business. So maybe that's a good gauge if you're similar where technology is not your core product, but otherwise it really, it really varies depending on, I guess, what, what you're doing and what your stage is. Early days, I'm a big, I'm very much in favor of spending as little as possible while you're testing and every dollar spent should be at least giving you meaningful data so that you can mm. then make those decisions of what yeah. you're spending. And then if you are at a point where you actually want to go for a raise, for example, and your raise is to build technology, then you can actually have a good assessment of, all right, well, it takes us this much time to do this task manually. When we build technology, knowing it can automate that, this is what the cost saving is going to be. And if you have numbers to that degree, it's really powerful when you're raising or getting people on board because it just shows that you really know your business inside and out. And so that's how I would advocate actually working out, well, what is the percentage that we should be spending on this or what should that look like as we scale the business by having that core data of, you know, what, what are you saving by having it be technology instead of people or automated instead of people? I hope that makes sense. I'm sorry, it's a bit of a comment. Yeah, no, I think Gemma, yeah, Gemma, you asked the question. I hope um, that's answered your question. It's answered mine. Um, we have another question from Genevieve saying, alongside that question, how do you manage screened volunteers with low tech skills? Oh, I know that problem very well because um, of our cohort um, of family systems that we hire mostly are digitally illiterate. So mm -hmm. what we have been doing and what we've learned is that everything needs to be by, it needs to be smartphone focused because not everyone's got a laptop or access to a computer. And we actually really moved to just using simple text messages. Um, it's actually part of why that other question was difficult for me to answer because whenever we try to use different tech mm. technologies, it, the liter technical literacy was not there. Most HR software available was actually for white collar workers, mm -hmm. um, desk, the, not for deskless workers, which is a real, <clears throat> I think is quite interesting. So we we just met them at their level. They didn't have email addresses, but they've got text myths that they can text or they're using WhatsApp. And so by they're using WhatsApp and usually they can, they're good with video calls. So we just redesigned our system to make things easier for them. And then once we knew what that was, then you can kind of do, you know, what are the text message templates that we can send people to make it mm -hmm. faster for us on our end? What are the automations you can put in, in WhatsApp, like WhatsApp for business and things like that. So they yeah. can go in and still be texting on their end. So it's familiar to them, um, but it's still not going to be as time as <clears throat> for us when you're dealing with hundreds of people. And this is something that we've, that we've seen within some of the other community organizations that we work with as well. When you're dealing with people with low digital literacy, it's 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 just fairer and easier for everyone to say, well, what are you using? What are you familiar with? And then work backwards from there. Um, fair, Genevieve, I hope that answered your question. But it's important, right, to think about it. Um, not everyone gets tech. Um, honestly, admittedly, beyond Zoom, yeah. <laughs> like I struggle with anything else. So. Um, it, it can be hard. Um, I wanted to touch upon that. Um, you spoke about documentation um, just before the audience questions. And, um, you know, it sounds like a lot of these things um, depend on like there's an external reliance on this sort of design. How do you ensure that anyone can run the system? You know, now that you have done that with M-Time, how do you ensure anyone can run it? Do you, you know, you, do you have to keep a, like track records of the stuff that you're doing or giving out or delegating? How does it work in the long term? Yeah, you need to have um, good documentation. And I think the, the most critical thing is that making sure everyone knows that if you, you can change something because is you the person who's executing on this, you will inevitably find better, faster, more efficient ways to do things. But you have to write it down, otherwise it doesn't fly. Like that's the only rule that I have with my team of like, I trust you because you're doing it more than I am at this point, but it needs to be documented. It needs to be documented in this fashion. So sometimes we'll do audits. Um, we did check-ins like once every quarter of like, all right, this is the system, what's changed? Especially because sometimes you you know things are chaotic with setups, you do forget, but it's like, what's changed? You see it, you're like, oh, actually quite a bit of this is out of date. And then we go back and you document. And we actually do different right. versions for each time. So we have the historical one, so we can go back and look. But each quarter when we were going in and doing that auditing, we'd, you know, copy it, 
redo it, make the changes, add new inputs, especially when it came to the customer service and training side of things. We're constantly learning <coughs> or all those different problems will arise like between pre-COVID and post-COVID of people's behavior. We had to kind of redocument and redesign. Mm. So we were always, that was far more frequent. It was almost every month of going in and saying, all right, what's changed? What can we do better? Um, and I think that is, it's, it's, a, it's an annoying thing to do at the start, mm. but I think one of the really gratifying pieces is that once you've got that system really on track, you're looking through when you're doing your audit and you're actually not changing it that much. You're like, oh no, this is actually, this is actually pretty close. Or there's only like a one or two things that we've changed. And so you're like, wow, we built something that really sticks. In terms of um, being able to know that anyone can run it, again, it really goes down to the documentation and it goes down to what you were saying before about you've got to take your head out of the weeds Mm. else to have a trust yeah Yeah. and if if someone else is reading it because in theory you want it to be someone's reading it or watching the video or however it is that you've documented it and if they don't understand it then you've got a problem like that's how you know that it's not working um if they can follow it and it's simple or at least the questions they have are really informed questions then you're like okay cool this is i can i still know that i can give this to someone else and it's going to still work um, yeah, makes sense. Um, it's so interesting though, when you're saying you're working with people and their behaviors and changes. And I was thinking about this when I was um, thinking of like, you know, what are the, what are the, what are the risks involved with this notion of like, let's just like letting systems run um, by themselves or letting anyone else run the system. So have you found anything particularly risky um, about, um, you know, setting something up and having someone else run with it? Yeah. So sometimes, um, again, because we're a real people business, you know, you have your set rules of this is what you do if X, if X things happen. And sometimes when, when we had it where it was like far too literal of like, you only do one of these three things. Um, sometimes one of those three things doesn't quite fit, but then people feel stuck because you're like, well, well I've got to follow the guide. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things that we did is just like, if like, you know, just have that contingency of like, if these things really don't fit, um, just one, escalate it. Um, like it's always okay to escalate if it really doesn't fit in that scenario. And then what we also did was give examples of like, here's a situation where like something doesn't fit to contextualize when, when does it make sense that like, you know what, I'm going to go off script and I'm going to do something different versus mm-hmm. um, when is it that like, oh, I'm being a bit too finicky of like whether these three things fit. And I think having those examples um, really, really helps. Like we have as part of our training system, um, we have like maybe 20, 30 different scenarios of like every really wild and crazy thing that's ever happened, that's ever happened at M time, oh which you do. Um, and then it's very funny, actually. It's one of my favorite activities that we have someone new because like, this didn't happen. I'm like, oh, absolutely. <laughs> this is this is the book of truth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> these are yeah, real like, life, real life examples. Yeah, well, like if you can get through these and just kind of prep your thinking around it, um, every you'll find as soon as you start, it will never be as difficult as this, but just to kind of <laughs> for it so even then it's like getting that trust is what's the system to build the trust what's the system to help people think about how you would solve it as a founder in the same way to see like what are those common patterns um and doing that the scenario task is part of onboarding and we make everyone do that regardless of whether you're in recruitment customer service we say you you have to actually go through and talk to all our stuff you have to do all these customer service scenarios because that is the absolute best way to understand the business um I love this idea of um, writing down everything that's gone wrong um, to be able to learn from it. Um, we have another audience questions from a uh, question, or actually a couple of questions from Brighton. As a solo founder, how do you hire in anticipation of when you need, to, like when your needs require extra resources? So like staying ahead of the curve and avoiding hiring when the business has reached a point where you're literally just like struggling. Yeah. So um, for me, I, I am not financially minded at all whatsoever, but um, ever since I learned the value of how much your financial forecast and your cash flow model will tell a story, I love it. I was like, oh, I, I remember feeling resentful that maths wasn't taught that way at school because I probably would have been a lot more interested in realizing how powerful it is um, because it was exactly that. Because I had done everything manual to start, I knew that it's going to take X, I can't even remember off the top of my head now, but when I was when I was <laughs> doing it, it takes X amount of time from a family to sign up to when we can match them. 
And I was like, I went. And so then because I was able to give all those timings to my um, financial advisor, she was able to put them in a spreadsheet for me. And she said, well, when you get to like, say, 50 customers, it's not going to be physically feasible for you to do it because it's going to take you this many hours. So you need to be making this much revenue so that you can be able to hire this person. So like being able to. So that's where the systems and documentation Mm -hmm. is powerful um, before you like make those investments and things because you could be like, oh, wow. okay, so. It takes this much time to do all these tasks. I'm going to need X many people to do it, or I'm going to need to build a system to get rid of it. Which system is actually going to save enough time that will justify that spent? And then you can like, once you've got your model, you can play around with it. You can get excited. Like, you know, I've got my big growth goals. What is that going to look like? Yeah. Um, and it makes it a lot more fun because you can see how your business will play out. And then on the flip side, you're also very empowered because you'll be able to see like, wow, if we actually go lower or if we if we decline by 10% or something like that, I can't keep this person on. So maybe I only want to hire them on a casual basis and things like that. Um, so that's that was by far the best way that I was able to do it. Um, and it took me a while to really appreciate the number aspect of it. Um, true. I know. Um, I was actually talking to um, a friend of mine from the community space, um, Baz, who runs the Community Collective, and she was talking about, um, you know, figuring out when to get more people on board and when when you know when do you hire for more ambassadors and she's saying honestly like I know for example that the experience that the members um have at the moment um there's there's a particular ratio of how many people like I need to hire to ensure that those many people have an experience so I think running it by ratio is also quite um quite interesting um I wanted to get into um you know testing and refining systems and we're talking about like building and using them and and stuff but how do you know if a system um, that you've built or implemented is working for you? Like, what would you say are um, signs of a healthy design or green flags? Um, this is probably a, a weird answer, but for me, I'm like, how is my me- mental health and well being? Like, how am I feeling? It's a good one. Um, yeah. And I, and I, and I say that because. Um, as you were saying before, part of the anxiety and delegating and things like that is because you want to control and you don't trust. If I'm not worrying about that task because I've seen the outputs of the system, I can see that it's working well, then everything's going to be all right. And like, that's like my internal system. If you want to put like, you know, actually properly quantify it, it's looking and saying like, well, I know that matching usually takes this amount of time. If we have this Mm -hmm. many issues coming through, then we should have this many hours at the end of the week. And if I look and I'm like, why don't we have this many hours at the end of the week? What's happening with that system? Like all the pieces that come together to get the output that you design. So like those one or two things that you want each system to result in, checking on what those are, if you can put a number to it, or you can just be a bit uh, spiritual woo-woo and be like, how do I feel like me? Mm. <laughs> uh, then that's probably the best way to actually check the health of your system. And it will be reflected if you have a team as well, reflected in the team, like, are they really stressed and overwhelmed all the time? What's mm. wrong with the system? Is it that there's not enough people there? Is it that it's actually not working and it's too manual or it's too hard? to use the system because it's too technical. Um, so the health and well-being, I still, I still actually am I'm gonna stick with that as being like one of the really big things to look for. Oh, that's I'm a big fan. So science of a healthy design is how healthy you feel in here. Um, yeah, how healthy your team is as well. Yeah, yeah, that is um probably my favorite takeaway from this. Um Brighton had another um, there's a couple questions before I get into some of my um last questions for you. Brighton asked, what is the best tool for creating internal wikis and documenting processes? Yeah, so my favorite at the moment is probably Monday, um, because as you click into each thing, you can have different attachments and files and you can add videos and the like as well. But we also just use Google Docs um, and it's really easy. And one of the reasons why I like it is because it's so easy to track changes and it's just so simple to use. You don't need to have that high Mm -hmm. technical um, literacy. Um, and then the other one that we use quite a lot of, if, if it's a training, if it's something that we're building for training purposes, we put everything into Teachable as well, because I like that in assuring that it's done, you can actually add questions and reviews and things like that as well. So those are the ones that I use the most. Okay, so we've got Monday and we've got Teachable. Yep. Um, have that answered your question, Brighton? Um, Otsile um, has a question. Um, they have said, thanks for the tips. Um, what criteria do you use to determine if a task needs automation? So like, at what point do you stop doing something that's manual and, you know, recognize that, look, this, this needs software help? Yeah, well, I mean, if, if what you're doing um, always has 
the same result and like you know that like 90% of the time it's always going to have the same result like the example the best example I can give in my experience was like when we have a new customer we have them do a questionnaire and then we create that questionnaire into a guide um <clears throat> we used to manually copy and paste those answers and put them into that guide and we edit and put that and put it all in there um until again from stepping out it was like if every single time someone signs up you're going to have to create this guide why not automate it? And then anything, any exceptions mm. you could go in and edit. And so then doing that saved a lot of time. And then when we realized that there's a lot of things where it's like, when X happens, we have to do this. 90% of the time we're going to have to do this. It's time to stop doing that manually. Um, and again, as long as you've documented it, if it turns out that, you know, when someone does that, we actually want them to do something else instead, then you can go back and change it. But if you're doing the same thing every day and you're like, this has become its own system and there are means for me to automate it, especially with free tools that already exist, then absolutely it's time to automate it. Um, Celia, I hope that answered your question. Um, I wanted to also know, Sarah, we spoke about cool, healthy design. Um, when a system doesn't work for you, uh, obviously it's easy to, you know, you say when something doesn't work for you, don't use it anymore, but how do you start? how do you do the stop process? Do you just literally pull the plug? Um, wouldn't, wouldn't that affect the business or is there a little bit of a de-escalation method that you can do to wane yourself out? Yeah, this is when you get into change management. And I remember, it's so funny, yeah. I associate change management with like, you're a huge corporate. I was like, why would I need to know anything about that? But even if you've only got like 10 customers and you used to, you know, maybe you used to email all of them, but you want to switch to text messaging, that is still a change. And that is a process that needs to be managed. So what we usually do is we will test it with a couple people um, that we know like they're quick to respond. They're going to be happy to help us out. And we'll say, we are thinking of improving our systems by moving. Again, I'll use that example. We're moving from emails to text messages. Um, mm -hmm. we this out with you. So then we test it with them for a week or so, get their feedback. If that's working, then we're like, okay, great. Now we need to go and tell all our customers that we're now switching to this new method. And then we lay it out for them of like, this is what's going to happen. The old system is going to be live for like a couple of weeks after or whatever it is. Um, but we're going to slowly start migrating you because the main thing is just being really clear um, and being really certain that you are going to make that change, which is why it's so important to do that test uh, beforehand with a smaller group when you're going to make a change that's actually going to affect the business. If it's internal for the team, it's a bit easier mm. depending on your team size, but it's still actually basically the same thing because you're going to leave what the existing process was anyway and say, hey, we're going to experiment with this new piece. Maybe mm. the person your team is doing it or like, you know what, half of them we're going to do in this way, the other half we're going to do in the other. So it's still recorded in the old way. Um, yeah. we'll see if this is better. So you still have to stage it out. Um, and that's why as you grow, um, not only does the documentation become more important because you want to be able to remember what you're what you've changed, you want to be able to measure that the change actually does become easier. Um, and it also, but it also gets like slower. You can't be quite as agile because you've got to check in with all your stakeholders. Um, but it's still something that I think is really important to have an awareness of that you do have to manage the change, even if it's on a really small level. Um I think um, that it, that's sound advice in, 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 the, in the sense that like, because I, I didn't think of this question until way later and I'm like, yeah, but if something doesn't work, what do you do about it? Do you just absolutely stop implementing it, you know, organization wide? Um, or do you have to, like you said, stage it out? Yeah, you've um, got to test it first. Yeah. To make sure it's worth <laughs> making that big change. It's a lot of, yeah, it's a lot of um, work. You think you're automating stuff, but there's work that goes into, I guess, reaching that point of then being able to, you know, let the reins go. Yeah. Um, when, um, when you talk about, you know, tracking and documenting, are there any specific metrics for tracking that one should look out for specifically um, with any of these, um, you know, like detailed stages of operational design? Yeah, so again, that's one that will depend on your business and like what, what that's <clears throat> designed to do. But I think across the board for any business, if you're automating or designing something, you need to measure the time because the time it spends and then you put that against the cost, even if you're not paying yourself yet, just like give yourself what would be your market rate and say, well, it takes me two hours to do this every day. If I was working normally, I would be paid, I don't know, $50, $80 an hour, whatever it is. 
And then you can use that to feed in and plug in so that you need, again, for that piece of being able to map out your business, plan out who you're hiring, plan out how much, like how much you want to invest in technology and other systems. Um, I think that is the absolute number one thing to really, really track and have a look at at the beginning. If nothing else, just track how much time you spend doing everything, even if you're not trying to build a system or anything. It'll be so handy. Like when I was raising, I remember the fact that I could be so specific with every single thing of the business of like, yeah, I don't have technology yet, but I can show you like this is the map and I can demonstrate all of this for you. And it was a, it was a real edge to have just to be that clear. Um, that's amazing. Honestly, um, I think when it, when you when it comes down to metrics, sometimes it can be really hard to um, to figure out how to track something. Um, something that is, um, you know, constantly changing in your business. Um, but and I guess on the same, um, same, I wanted to ask if you had any resources or like tips for founders who are looking to build systems right now for their startups and their businesses. Yeah, I think um, one of the ones that I looked at a lot was actually going on Product Hunt. And that was because I mean, it wasn't that long ago, but just technology has just moved so quickly. Um, I just wanted to be really across anything that could help me move things faster and just looking at reviews and things like that. And then speaking to other founder friends as well. I did a lot of like cold outreach to people who were doing something like similar-ish just to find out how they were doing things as well. Um, Because the challenge is like, because the operational part of your business, often if it's a startup, you're doing something that's you know, hasn't been done before. Um, there has to be a bit of, there's got to be a little bit of creativity and you can't necessarily copy paste, but speaking to people who have done similar things, keeping abreast of what's happening in terms of the product and tool space, like what do people like using at the moment? Um, that's one of the things I would really advocate for a lot. Um, I'm also really happy to chat to anyone because I nerd out on this. I really love figuring out how you can design things. And at Arctic, that's the main thing that we do. Like a lot of what we're doing is just doing operational audits for people and saying, mm -hmm. well, what's your 30, 60, 90 day plan to get from where you are now to where you want to be? And what does that operational design look like? Um, and we'll be adding more resources than like to our website, which are available for free for people to look through as we start growing as well. Well, that's so good. Yeah. Um, for everyone on the call, we will share, um, you know, the the website and all the resources that we have spoken about. Um, we've got a question for, um, time for one last question. And we have one from Genevieve. Um, how do you automate random emails received with different types of requests? Um, is there a way to do that? Yeah, definitely. So the, there's different email marketing tools that can do this for you. But if you're really specific, um, you can you do it on, on Zapier, actually. I don't remember off the top of my head because we did it with a JavaScript because ours is very particular because it's like, if they've used these certain words and the sentence is this long, like this is how granular, granular mm. if the sentence is this long, then this means this person is X, Y, Z. Like 90% of the time that's the case. And then oh, wow. review the people that um, were in that category and then we'd mark them to the next to the next stage. And so we just had a JavaScript in Zapier that we were able to do, but I would not be surprised if there is something that will do that now that you don't even need to have a JavaScript for. But even then that JavaScript I found on, was it GitHub or something similar? I just, mm. I just found one and then um, customized it to what I needed it to be. Um, and I'm not technically minded. So it was, um, so it was quite easy to do. Um, so yeah. And the other thing that you can do, most email tools should do this though. Like even on HubSpot, you can absolutely categorize, like if, when someone's, as part of your design, say somebody's filling in a form, often you'll probably notice when you sign up for something, you have to pick the category that's yeah. to help <laughs> delegate it in the system. It's like funnel it in. Yeah, yeah so. exactly. So that's the other thing of like, what's the beginning of your system? Like what is actually, what is the way that people are inputting information and how can you, how can you edit it? If you're on a Mac, you should be able to just add filters. Um, I don't use a Mac, but you should be able to just add filters and stuff because I can do that on Gmail. Um, for different um, things if you go to settings or if you go to settings and it's like the advanced you should be able to add filters in so that you can kind of um, delegate them through the only annoying thing is that I think it only tags them and won't actually put them in different mm. forms. yeah um when I imagine it's 2023 and tech is still confusing um well we're almost out of time I just wanted to ask you what is the best way for anyone on the call to connect with you um you know learn more about M time arctic yeah well anyone's welcome to reach out to me on LinkedIn um just give a search for my name um otherwise jump on the arctic website like we do like consults just to have a chat to see if we can help or anything like that or if operational audits if you're like this is quite overwhelming and you just want that extra 
hand, um, extra hand to go through it, just kind of like weeds out um, and help with it, executing it as well. Um, we've been doing that of late quite a bit and it's been, I've, I've loved it. I've loved learning about yes. other people's businesses um, and just helping them, you know, map out the next three months and working out what they need. Um, really, really happy to help. So welcome to reach Amazing. out. Yeah, I'll share, um, I'll share all those links with um, everyone that signed up. Um, all right, that's what we're, we're done. It's um, lunch off. Anyone that's not had lunch, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I have loved chatting with you. I knew maybe 5% of any of this stuff today, and I'm proudly more educated about this. So lots to lots to share with my team. Um, for everyone on the call, we will share the recording um, by tomorrow. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, and yeah, we'll see you soon at our next control. Yeah, thank you so Bye much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Sarah.